and welcome to everybody. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes? Okay, great. Um, we've got 10 presenters today and I'd like to welcome everybody else who's logged on. It's um, great to have so many of you joining us. Um, thank you particularly to Eddie and Juliet for, at Visa and the Africa IR group, especially Peter and Dele for helping organise this event. My name's Julia and I run the Understanding State to Through Architecture in Africa project um, from SOAS, University of London. This event is the second that we've organised which pulls together scholars working on politics and architecture across Africa from different disciplines. And we met last year first in Johannesburg in collaboration with the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Studies and the Graduate School of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg. And we began our conversations about the political dimensions of architecture across many different contexts um, in Africa. Um, and we covered all sorts of buildings, which will be discussed today, including housing, palaces, libraries, airports, shopping centres, cathedrals, and many more. Um, since then, since last year, we've been working on developing our papers to make an edited book, which we aim to get done by the end of this year. Um, and today we're going to present some of those papers which are evolving, so they're works in progress, and we're particularly delighted to have input from um, all the people that have joined us. Um, questions and comments are really, really very welcome. The programme is organised into three panels with breaks in between. Um, obviously people will come and go throughout the day. Please do feel free to drop out and return as you need to or want to, or stick with us throughout the day. Um, the breaks for lunch and tea are fairly chunky ones, but sadly, no opportunities for meeting each other informally. Um, I very much hope that by the time we produce the book from this collection of papers, we'll be able to have a proper physical launch. Um, the programme is slightly different to that originally organised, um, so I'm just going to quickly tell you what's happening in terms of, of the content, so that you know where you might want to drop in and out. Um, the first panel, which is now, is on making, and there are three papers. Joe and Dawit's paper on um, the airport in Ethiopia. Emmanuel's paper on the Ghana's National um, Cathedral project. And Innocent's uh, paper on Malawi's uh, parliament, which has been funded by the Chinese. That goes till 12, then we'll break for lunch and reconvene at one o'clock. And at one o'clock we have panel two, um, which is about living, and we have four papers. We have Irene's paper on housing programmes in Ghana. We have um, my and Ariane's paper on Cote d'Ivoire's public buildings. Um, we have Tondi's paper on colonial legacies of, um, uh, of a, a shopping mall in Zimbabwe. And we have Marie's paper on Nairobi's public libraries. That takes us till three, and then at three we break for tea and come back at half past three, panel three, final panel of the day on imagining, three more papers, Daniel's paper on Pan-Africanism and the African Union building, Tony's paper on the reconstruction of the Ashanti Palace, and Laura's paper on prisons in Nigeria. So that's how the programme looks. Um, we'll hear from each presenter in each panel. We'll do it just like a conference panel. So each speaker will have around 10 minutes. They'll take it in turns and then we'll open up the floor to um, questions from you. Um, you can post your questions in the chat and we will find them and read them out. Um, or you can put your hand up and ask your question physically. Uh, so without um, any more explanations, I think we'll just start. So I'm chairing the first panel. Um, the first panel is loosely arranged around the theme of making. So papers here look at how buildings are made the politics of who makes them and what they're made for, and then turning that around, what kinds of politics are made by buildings. The first paper is from Joanne Tomkinson and Dawit Yekoyeso. Jo is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Politics at SOAS. Her research explores the role of airport buildings and infrastructure in national development strategies, focusing on Ethiopia and Ghana. And her co-author, Dawit, is a lecturer and social researcher in the Department of Sociology at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. His main research interests are social development and the interface between social sciences and health. And their paper, as you can see, I hope, 
uh, is called Grounding Africa's International Relations, Global Ambitions and National Identity in Ethiopia's Airport Expansion. Over to Joe. Hello everyone. Um, it's really good to see you all today virtually. Um, so as Julia said, um, my name's Joanne Tomkinson and I'm going to be presenting a co-authored chapter today that's about the international dimensions of state building in Africa as told through a study of Bole International Airport in Addis Ababa. Uh, my co-author on the chapter Dawit Yeke Yeso uh, is here today too and he'll join in the, the, the Q&A. Um, next slide please Sunil. So first of all, I wanted to explain a bit about why we think airports are interesting vantage points to focus on international relations. Um, we chose to focus on them firstly because they're foundational gateway buildings. So they're often the first thing visitors see when entering a country and the last thing as they leave. So they're very important junctures between a country and the outside world, both materially and symbolically. They also have an interesting, specifically African history. So at independence, for instance, many African leaders set up national airlines as part of efforts to rewrite aerial connections on the continent as part of a pan-African spirit of integration and cooperation. And more recently, Africa has emerged as a, what some people refer to as a sort of last global frontier of aviation. And it's one of the, until COVID, of course, fastest growing uh, areas of air travel in the world. Um, Ethiopia specifically is a very interesting place from which to examine these, not least because it was the first Af African country to set up its own independent state-owned airline in the 1940s and became an inspiration for others uh, who followed. Um, it's also recently become a major African aviation hub and a kind of gateway between Africa and uh, China and the Middle East in particular through the activities of Ethiopian Airlines, which is something that we'll refer back to repeatedly in this chapter. So Bole struck us as a good place to consider Ethiopia's changing place on the continent in the world. Um, and to do this, we wanted to do something a bit more rounded than a typically top-down state-centric analysis that you often find in international relations. Um, so methodologically, we collected and drew on three kinds of data, which we can talk a bit more perhaps about in the Q&A if needed. The first of these being elite interviews with those responsible for the airport's expansion over time. The second being document analysis, including from archives and newspapers, as well as um, reports prepared by various government bodies responsible for the airport. Um, and the third focus group discussions, which were conducted in Amharic in February this year with residents of Addis from different socioeconomic groups, such as government workers, construction workers, cleaners and students. Next slide, please. So as you can see, this is just a, a picture of the outside um, of Bole International. So as you can see, the airport's highly modern. Uh, a new international terminal was constructed there in the early 2000s uh, and it's currently being extended again. Um, next slide, please. And this is an interior shot, as you can see. Um, and in many ways, I think you'd say the airport looks almost like any other in the world. So at first glance, it appears to reflect what, what in the chapter we call extroverted state building and extroverted building. And this reflects a tendency we suggest that's shared by both the literature on Africa's international relations and that on modern architecture to reduce relations between national and global processes to a, a sort of zero sum logic. So, for instance, popular ideas about Africa's international relations include Bayart's idea of extroversion and Cooper's idea of the gatekeeper state. And these portray elite agendas in Africa as, as sort of aligned with outside interests. And these are in turn seen to be advanced at the expense of more sustained domestic state building efforts. And similar logics can be found in writings about architecture and globalization. So Orge, for instance, bases his discussion on the non-places of supermodernity around air travel and says airports are characteristic here and they lack identity, history or social relations due to their subordination to what he calls the logics of late capitalism. 
I. Bellings takes this idea further and says globalization has produced architectural homogenization, neutral, abstract, shiny box structures which can't be recognized or differentiated from each other and that only by reading on the text outside of a building uh, like in the last slide may may you actually know where in the world you are and so for all these writers those from IR those from architecture it's as if the global has overwhelmed overtaken or distorted the domestic or national process and yet as King notes global buildings are often recoded and redefined through their encounters with domestic actors, histories and processes. So in reality, this relationship is quite often much more complex and messy. Next slide, please. So in short, our argument in this chapter is that extroversion is not a very good way to understand what's happening at Bole Airport and its connections with Ethiopia's international relations. And we make that argument in two steps. The first is rooted in the elite interviews and the document analysis and we find through um, through the analysis of those sources that airports have long been at the vanguard of Ethiopia's efforts to present a modernizing face to the world. From the imperial period when Bole was first constructed um, to the present. So not only do we find have there being continuities at the level of personnel, expertise, plans and planning through the imperial period, carried on through the military Derg regime and continued by the EPRDF. The airport has also always been a place throughout this period that we're discussing where the Ethiopian government has sought to advance the country's international relations, its economic development and the development of its national airline in particular. And so the development of the airport site over time, in short, we find has been driven firmly by forces inside the Ethiopian state. And so under this sort of gleaming modern facade that you saw on the last slide, we find a story of continuity as much of one of rupture and a story where imperialism meets supermodernity, as, as we call it. Next slide, please. Uh, that's not to say there are no constraints impacting the design of Bole International Airport and interviewees, particularly those involved in the architectural or engineering commissioning of the airport, did express some reservations that um, both time pressures and resource constraints meant that a more indigenous design wasn't possible to be created. Um, so instead, as you can see here, this is Axum Airport. Um, next slide, please. This is Lalibela Airport. What you see is that attention has been given to regional airports and to incorporating um, airport designs that reflect the traditional Ethiopian architecture that might be found in the, the area surrounding the airport. Next slide, please. So the next step of our argument is rooted in the focus group discussions. And at first, these seem to support the idea of the airport as a site of extroverted or outward orientated building and state building. So participants did describe the airport in ways that, that at times made it seem an alien, strange or un-Ethiopian building, reflecting disappointment that the building failed to reflect the country's long history, its diverse cultures or its very, very strong and continuous architectural um, heritage. Next slide, please. Uh, some views indicative of this are shown on, on the slide, and I won't read them out for time reasons, but one of the things that struck us was how uh, interesting and perhaps surprising it was that a discussion of a modern airport building would quickly in the focus groups turn to discussion of the country's 12th century rock-hewn churches at Lalabela as the second quote here shows. So there's a sort of sense of disappointment here often associated with a distinction that, that participants seem to be drawing between the Ethiopian and the outside. So for instance, one participant said the buildings, the airport buildings are very beautiful, but they failed under the influence of Western style. Next slide, please. Um, however, the story emerging from the focus group discussions, in fact, turned out to be quite a bit more nuanced than this, I'd say. Um, especially when people shifted to talking uh, from the building's form to its function, and particularly here, the links between the airport and Ethiopian Airlines. And it's worth noting here, actually, how indistinguishable these appeared to, to be to people. Quite often, Dawit would try and focus conversation on the airport but it would prove rather impossible in practice to, to get people to draw uh, a meaningful distinction between the airport and the airline. 
And at this point, the airport appeared much closer to taking on the status of what we call an icon of national pride, much like the air airline itself. So three th themes emerged here. The first was about the role played by the airport in connecting Ethiopia to the world. References were made to by people to the airport as a leading gateway to the Horn of Africa. Second, people stressed how important the airport and airline were for communicating and representing Ethiopia. So one said approvingly, in my view, Ethiopian Airlines represents us on the international stage as Egypt's pyramids symbolize Egypt. And third, the airport was thought to be vital in helping rewrite and reshape international perceptions of the country's image and again through the operation of the airline so one person said the success of the airline increases the acceptance of Ethiopia in the world and it's notable here that in the shifting governance around the airport that the airline now owns the airport of Bole which is really untypical globally indeed so powerful and compelling we thought was this sense of pride transferred from the airline to the airport one participant remarked, I've not even visited Bole Airport, so I could not say anything about the changes, but it is our pride. Notably then, I think all three themes, connection, communication and rewriting Ethiopia's image in the world, have a strong sense of active domestic agency. So rather than being considered a non-place or a symptom of Ethiopia's extroversion simply, the airport building was thought to be helping to alter the course of the country's international relationships despite the anxieties that, that are notable uh, through the modernization and, and modern design. But here again, these layers of meaning, I think, further complicate the zero-sum perspectives discussed at the start of the chapter. So just quickly in conclusion, our chapter highlighted the deep connections between Bole International Airport and Ethiopian state building and and national identity formation in, in two ways. First, the logic, plans, personnel underneath the airport's expansion have long expressed a confident domestic state building agenda, and there are significant continuities underpinning that, despite the massive ruptures that have occurred between the imperial, military, and um, market-oriented developmentalist uh, regimes that Ethiopia has, has experienced since, since the airline was established in the 1940s and popular perceptions of the airport also show its great significance to ordinary Ethiopians in reimagining and rewriting the country's place in the world. So thank you. Handing over to Emmanuel. Before I, before I hand over to Emmanuel, thank you Joe. Um, I just want to introduce Emmanuel. Um, so we're going to move on to our second paper now. Um, Emmanuel Kuzi Ofori Sapon is an architect and lecturer in architecture at Central University in Ghana. His research focuses on urban planning, housing, and on religious architecture. Um, Emmanuel, I think you're going to run your own slides. Yes. Is that right? Are you, are you up and ready to do that? Yes. Um, while you're doing that, I'm going to reveal the name of your, of your, the title of your talk, which is Building Heaven on Earth. Rhetoric and Ritual in the Politics of Ghana's National Cathedral. Ready to go? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, my particular interest in architecture, um, as has already been revealed, um, deals particularly with religious architecture and, and the politics surrounding it. Um, and in this particular paper, like Julia has already said, I'm going to discuss Ghana's proposed national cathedral. Now, the story of this cathedral started on the 6th of March 2017, when the newly elected president of Ghana cut the sword for what he called the National Cathedral of Ghana. According to him, this project was supposed to be a place where all Christians would gather on state occasions, which he said included things like the, <clears throat> the death of presidents, um, the inauguration of presidents. Um, and to, to drive home the point, he held this very colorful sword cutting event um, to which he invited um, prominent religious figures to help him to launch the pro project. Now, um, the timing of this particular project um, drove home the point that um, he was, by this action, ushering Ghana into a very new and interesting era of the relationship between religion and politics, one in which architecture, but particularly this building, was going to play a pivotal role. And they claimed that the building physicalized the moment when the Ghanaian church 
in a sense, cuts the umbilical cord from the European architecture by sidestepping the Gothic cathedrals that, in their opinion, um, architecture, um, Ghanaian architecture has had a tendency to imitate over the years. Um, and again, because it was the 60th independence anniversary, the project became part of a nationalist um, agenda of showing you know, Ghanaian assertiveness and independence. To help him do this, he set up a board of trustees that comprised um, leaders from various religious groups in the country, some of the most prominent, and of course, some of those with the largest um, following in the country. Now, um, to ground this in some previous work, it is, it is the case that post-colonial nations have undertaken um, grand architectural projects, yet, um, as I, I, I will show, the state-initiated cathedral intended for all Christians rather than a specific denomination is rare. And as Vail says, um, such grand symbolic state buildings need to be understood in terms of the political and cultural context that have helped to bring them into being. And that is precisely what I set out to do in this chapter. Um, I set out to trace the modes of public persuasion adopted by the political and religious elites to try and understand how they were trying to win over the public for this project. And then I sought to interrogate how the architecture, that is its aesthetic and embedded symbolism, was being instrumentalized in this rhetoric and particularly focused on the role that um, religion is playing through this building in the quest for political dominance in the Ghanaian political landscape. For my sources, I, I used speeches by, by the elite, um, media interviews that they granted official publications and this particular publication has become um, frequent. It's called the National Cathedral Update in which um, they put all the latest happenings as far as the project is concerned out to the public. What I argue is that the confluence of democratic politics, interdenominational Christianity and monumental architecture, as it occurs in this case, is not only unique in Ghana's political history, but has yielded exceptional forms of rhetoric and ritual which I set out to interrogate. Now to the, to the findings as it were. In looking at the primary data, as, as I have indicated, I categorized these into the arguments or the ideas that they sought to convince the public into two broad categories, one which I call the sacramental and the other which I call the missing link. Now the sacramental is grounded within Christian theology and it often refers to this idea of an object or an action that draws from or points to the divine. While the missing link is, is based on the president's own assertion that um, Ghana's political landscape has a missing link. There's something a missing link. There's something missing because we do not have such a building. Here are some examples of what I would call ideas that are grounded in sacramental and, and Christian ideology. To start with, the president said something like, I made a pledge to God and I'm determined to fulfill it. And this is um, one of the main drivers for the, for the project, which is that according to him, he pledged that if he won the election, he would build a cathedral for God. And so this is meant to be an act of thanksgiving for both him and the country. And then um, others on the board made claims such as the, the cathedral signifies the fact that God is in the midst of Ghanaians. Now, all of these are for me ideas that I call sacramental. Now, these sacramental ideas are also instrumentalized to, de to, to defend other aspects of the project. So that, for example, when the president donated prime state land, which is close to the national parliament and other prominent state buildings to the, to the building of this project, um, a lot of people naturally protested. And one member of the board said, the site is super, the site is the best, God deserves the best. So that every action that is related to the cathedral now became part of this rhetoric of an offering, which is an idea which is very grounded within Christian theology, like I say. Now, while some of these ideas may sound absurd to um, somebody looking in from the outside, um, I argue that they are particularly persuasive because they draw on imagery that um, ideas of making offerings to God um, in, in expression of thanksgiving or in expectation of something is quite common within the Ghanaian Christian landscape and in a country where 70% um, um, affiliate with Christianity, um, these arguments are quite potent and, and are useful to helping the religious and the political elites achieve what they set out to do. Regarding the cathedral as a missing link, the 
president's own words where he says that I believe there has been a missing link in the national architecture of Ghana. And if you were to um, delve deeper into this notion of there being a missing link, you would begin to see that it is really grounded in the idea that, and as one um, person puts it, all great nations have such spaces um, within their countries. And so um, to show that we have also um, come of age, the elite argue that we need to have such a building as well. And of course, in this regard, they point to um, Britain and America in particular. And in this quote by the architect, when he was pressed by being asked, why do we need a cathedral when we still have a lot of basic um, issues to, and infrastructure issues to meet? He says, for example, that when St. Paul's was built, London was a terrible place to live in. The people said, you don't need it. And yet it became a prominent piece of architecture for London. And so we can, in a sense, follow these footsteps. Again, a page from the cathedral update where the president visited the Washington National Cathedral, and I'll, I'll throw more light on this um, shortly, um, where it states categorically that the Washington National Cathedral is the inspiration for um, Ghana's own cathedral. Now, what may seem like an irony for a, for a nation, in a sense, the, the irony is that while seeking to do a piece of architecture that shows your own independence and, and in a sense, your capacity to assert yourself on the global stage, the elites um, rely a lot on um, precedents from the West, as I have indicated, and in justifying it based on what has been done in the West. Um, but beyond this, I, I, in looking at the primary data, I have observed a certain um, reliance beyond just looking to the West for inspiration, to looking for other forms of support. And I show here that as far back as February 2018, there was a relationship established between the board the Washington Cathedral, the American Museum of the Bible and the American Bible Society. And subsequently, this led to the visits of the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast, whose co-chair is the Republican Congresswoman and presidential aspirant, Michelle Bachman. Now, just to throw more light, the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast is a group founded by the Israeli parliament to mobilize the international community of churches, like they say, and governments, government leaders to align themselves in prayer to God's purpose for Israel and Jerusalem, which I think is a very nice way of saying, um, trying to um, gather global support for the interest of Israel in the Middle East. Um, because when you look at the rhetoric surrounding this group, that seems to be what um, the agenda is about. And subsequently, back to the idea of um, the American Christian right and reliance on America, Carrie Summers, who was the founding president of the American Bible of the Museum, was appointed to the board um, as an advisor. Subsequently, the board also honored Jim Inhofe, who is um, a, Republican, um, a Republican senator for his role in facilitating the board's relationships with various institutions in the United States of America. Um, now, this alliance with the American Christian rights, as I, as I indicate, has resulted in a sort of de facto connection to pro um, pro-Israel interest groups. And for example, when the, the, the Minister of Finance was invited by the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast again about a year later to, to speak at their meeting in the Israeli parliament, he invited the, the, the audience, which was made up of um, Israelis and international audience, all of whom had met for the purpose of, again, um, supporting Israel. He invited them to join in the building of the cathedral. And here you see how he instrumentalizes the architecture by saying that um, it is based on the inspiration from the tabernacle, which is um, a piece of architecture that is found in Jewish and Christian scriptures. And this quest to connect the project to Israel um, resulted in the 5th of March this year in the laying of a foundation stone, which um, was claimed to have been taken from the Wailing Wall in Israel. And it was a very colorful ceremony where the stone was presented by the Israeli ambassador to Ghana. And in one shot, you see the American ambassador in Kyrie Summers, who was the founding museum of the founding president of the Museum of the Bible in attendance. Now, beyond all of this verbal rhetoric and in a sense, um, political rituals, um, there has also been the visual rhetoric. And in this, in the chapter, I focus particularly on the images that were put around the site which I found particularly interesting because they had become part of the visual language of the city and had become a means of convincing people of various aspects of the project. In this particular image, you see, in a sense, a visual argument by the architect showing that the, the geometry or the form of the cathedral 
uh, is based on a combination of ideas from the Jewish um, old men's tabernacle and the traditional umbrellas that um, a lot of um, traditional rulers use in Ghana. And he seeks to say that there's a connection between these two forms of architecture. And it is this connection that has culminated in a sense in the architecture of the cathedral. In addition to this, there's a lot of imagery that seeks to say that the cathedral's architecture, again, is grounded in the identity, the tradition, the community um, ideas and the history of Ghana. And yet a close observation would reveal that a lot of these images are in fact from one particular, although the majority ethnic group in Ghana, they are Khan, and even more specifically, the Ashanti subgroup. So that um, if one were to look at the images, even though these are called national images, um, a lot of minority symbols and ideas are, are muted and not represented here. So the question I ask is whose interest does this serve? Because obviously, in my opinion, I argue that the, the cathedral does not necessarily serve any need of the Ghanaian Christian community. Um, so on the part of the NPP, um, I argue that they gain, it's, it's a win-win it's a situation for both parties, whether religious elite or political elite, because um, uh, uh, the president's first step of appointing the religious leaders to serve on the board was a first act of legitimation. And they in turn, as credible, you know, people um, as credible individuals of the community give credence to his actions by affirming what he does. And it positions the NPP, the political party to which the president belongs as a friend of religion and his presidency um, as a divinely orchestrated you know, um, action rather than just a mere act of um, political victory. And it gives the Christian elite um, resources to foreground, especially evangelical theology, um, in the politics of, of Ghana. And I argue this because the secretary, for example, said we're expecting major donations from our US donors and who are willing to give substantive amount of money. And based on a lot of the rhetoric, um, it is obvious that they're expecting donations and support from the American Museum of the Bible and from various pro-Israel groups. And so in concluding, I argue that this sort of alliance with the American Christian right, and particularly with various pro-Israel groups, Whichever um, support that brings, it cannot be seen as a benign act of kindness, but could have profound um, impact on Ghana's foreign policy or Middle Eastern foreign policy. And finally, I would say that it reveals a very interesting tension in this post-colonial project that um, the state is undertaking, um, especially when in a time where this slogan, Ghana Beyond Aid, has become a very, um, important slogan for the president and his and his um, followers and yet how to resolve that um, self-reliance vis-a-vis the necessary international or external partnerships that are necessary to accomplish them and it reveals a certain tension in in a lot of these actions thank you very much Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I think we're now switching control back to Sunil, who's going to run the slides for the final paper of this panel, which is coming to us from Innocent Batsani Tube, who uh, is a um, PhD candidate at the Politics and Department at SOAS, uh, University of London. Uh, IB's research is about Chinese funded parliament buildings in Lesotho, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. And his paper today is entitled Made in China. Oh, sorry, it seems to have changed the title. I'll read it from the screen. China's Parliament Building Gift to Malawi, Exploring Its Rationale, Tensions and Asymmetrical Gains. Over to you, IB. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof. Julian. Uh, good, good morning, um, everybody. Um, and uh, thank you to, to Pisa. Um, let me start with, a, with an anecdote. Um, so when I was doing this uh, research, um, I stumbled upon a, a Hansard uh, record, which is a parliamentary record. Um, and uh, the building that I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on, the member of parliament, one of the members of parliament then for a constituency called them Chinji Northeast, he said the following, I quote, um, this magnificent parliament building reminds me of that of King Solomon in the Bible, which was built for the Lord. But this one is constructed for honorable members like you and me. Glory be to God. 
Um, so you can see that uh, this uh, parliament building, you know, it enchanted, you know, members of parliament. Uh, but um, this kind of parliament building was not um, um, an ex rather an exception. Uh, in the past two decades, China has put a particular focus on financing and building of new parliament for African countries. Next slide, please. So um, at the last count, so um, uh, China has actually constructed 15 parliament buildings in the continent. These uh, landmark buildings are um, delivered in what uh, the Chinese government call complete aid project form. And just to give you a, a bit of picture of what is a complete aid project. So these uh, projects um, are constructed for recipient countries with the help of, um, of financial resources provided by China as grants or interest-free loans. The Chinese side is responsible for the whole or part of the process from the study, survey, design, construction, and provides all or part of the equipment and building materials and sends engineers and technical personnel to organize and guide the construction, installation, and trial production of these uh, projects. After the project has been completed, uh, China, you know, hands over the the, the, the building uh, to the recipient country. However, uh, from my own, uh, you know, research um, uh, in the three countries that I'm, uh, I'm working on in, in Zimbabwe, in Malawi, and uh, in, this, in the Soto, the, this does not actually mark the total exit of the Chinese. They usually continue to maintain the buildings through subsequent uh, three-year site bilateral agreement. So, the phenomenon that I'm studying is, uh, in put in simple words, is that China is engaged in an enterprise of donating parliament buildings to African countries. And uh, uh, this uh, building, in, in, uh, we'll, we'll see some of the pictures now, just a moment. But let me, let me just explain something a bit. So the building um, was constructed um, in Lilongwe, let me, uh, next slide, please. So um, these, these are just uh, some pictures of the building. I took some of these when, uh, um, because I noted th this one is the front of the of the building. I will explain a bit about you know how it looks, and then where I'm standing. This is the 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 amphitheater of. Um, uh, uh, the the building, so the building is in three parts. So China gave this parliament so building. Sorry, you can hear me. I think somebody's no, got that. Somebody yeah, hasn't yeah, yeah. muted their their. So, um, yeah, the, 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 the my Omar. I have written this. In can we mute my Omar? He's oh, that's brilliant. Sorry, IB, continue. Yep. So I was saying, um, so this building uh, was constructed and given to Malawi as a gift um, in 2010. Uh, it was uh, um, a gift to Malawi for ditching Taiwan. Before 2008, uh, Malawi had diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but uh, then they switched and the condition was that uh, China was going to construct a parliament building for um, for Malawi, and this was the first kind of the consummation of that uh, diplomatic arrangement. Um, and uh, in this case, this project was carried out as a complete um, aid uh, uh, project. Um, and so in this presentation, I'm actually leveraging the story of this Chinese funded parliament building to explore the tensions and asymmetrical gains of this type of uh, Chinese aid and uh, this uh, evolving relationships between um, African countries and China as a powerful actor in foreign relations. So um, I spent uh, uh, two months between July and September last year collecting data through engaging with the building and political actors in the long way. 
Specifically, I conducted uh, interviews. I, I did uh, multiple conversations, focus groups. I photographed the building um, and spent time inside the building observing how um, it operates and how people use the build, who use the building rather engage with it. So in the full length uh, book chapter, I, I go into detail of, in terms of this story. But for today, I just want to focus, I'll just briefly describe the building uh, and then look at the, the implications. I think it will get us going for the discussion. So in terms of uh, the, how it looks, already I'll put for you the, the, the front. So the, the, the picture on your, on your left of the screen where it's written Parliament Building, this is like, this is the reception checkpoint. So the, it's manned by soldiers and police. So when you get, so this is where you are cleared. So when you get into the building, on the left side of, um, of, of, of that checkpoint, there's a map of Malawi and 193 constituencies like, and there are stones there to signify each constituency. And as you get into the building, what you just see that is, that is um, um, visible uh, in, that, uh, in, that first, in that picture on your left is what they call the amphitheater. And that's where I'm standing. You see those colonnades. Um, that's the amphitheater, which is meant for crowds who would come and uh, 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 cheer the, the president when there is a state of the nation address and, uh, and also meant for, meant for petitions. And so this building is important again, not just to talk about how the building is like, but also to talk about where it's positioned because it's quite very important. So the parliament building is located in this Lilongwe city center and it foregrounds the, the government complex um, and is adjacent to the, the mausoleum of you know, the, their, their founding president, uh, Kamuz Banda. Um, and also there is a hotel, which was also by, built by the Chinese, but it's a recent one, and a, and a convention center named after Binguam Tarika. So this location actually places uh, the parliament at the epicenter of Lilongwe. Um, this parliament, like I say, it consists of this part that you see, but then there is the third element of the parliament, which is the, the main the main building. So it's in three parts. And next slide, please. So um, I decided, I have a number of pictures, but I decided to pick this picture for this discussion. So the, the main uh, building is a double story uh, structure and, and houses the debate chamber, members lounge, uh, offices and printing press. So the debate chamber, the one that you see there, is uh, the centerpiece of the, of the main building. It is carpeted an overshaped auditorium with a dome and there's blue draped member seats as you see. Um, and the seats that are above there, those are uh, public, gal public gallery seats. Um, so um, it's interesting, I took this picture. Uh, you, you can see that uh, there, are some, uh, there are some works going on there. Uh, this was 2019, so the building is continuously uh, being, uh, being, uh, being maintained. The dome is leaking, we'll come back to that. So the, the bulk of the functional space beyond the, the chamber is uh, reserved for offices. A part of the basement, well, I said it's a double story in the basement. Um, with, it has limited aeration, but inappropriately houses the printing unit so the staffers there were telling me that they have to contend with uh, health threatening fumes produced by their heavy duty printing machines. But in mitigation, the, the parliament provides milk uh, to, the, uh, to, to the printing press staffers. But however, the, the, the construction blips in the building are not only felt in the, in the basement. So this, the second floor is where the, the big, chiefs uh, stay and they will find that is also the, the, the red carpets there. Uh, but uh, the, the floor tiles occasionally peel off because the Chinese contractors, I'm told uh, by people there that they favored the use of cement 
as opposed to durable um, adhesive uh, mixture. And the building is also um, intermittently enveloped by a foul smell, which a presiding officer told me diplomatically, she referred to it as a plumbing challenge. And according to a parliament technician, the plumbing problem is due to the, what he called the, an initial poor workmanship by Chinese contractors. And, I, and as you can see on that uh, dome, uh, that uh, the, the, the debate chamber intermittently leaks and the Chinese contractors are always called in to fix it. And the situation is acute uh, during the, the rainy season. Uh, next slide, please. So now, um, I just, this is where uh, the business end of the, of the presentation. I just want to talk about uh, briefly the implications to Malawi or, or how this building is, is read by uh, my informants that I spoke about. So this is the main, this is the main building. So you remember I said, you saw the reception, you saw the, the amphitheater, and this is the main building. So um, in terms of uh, the positive side, uh, as it were, there are, those are the four points there that I put on that slide. For instance, the issue of um, accommodation of the legislature was quite an important thing for Malawi because uh, when, parliament, when the government was moved in terms of the capital city to Lilonga from Zomba, um, parliament did not have a home. So this idea of having a parliament was in itself a, a, noble, a noble undertaking. So that parliament now has a home is actually a good thing. That's, that's what my interlocutors uh, were, were, were actually saying. Then secondly, and, and, uh, and connected to that, the, the physical separation of the two arms of the state um, uh, happened uh, when Parliament got, got its building because before Parliament used the banquet room at State House as a debate chamber. So you would imagine that uh, they are there, they are debating, they are holding the executive to account and they are in a space, um, in, in, in an executive space. And my informants are telling me very interesting things about how uh, usually, you know, parliament uh, was uh, found, uh, or was operating under very extreme conditions and people couldn't go there because of that. Um, a case in point is when uh, there was the third term debate, you know, during the, uh, the Bakili Molusi time. The third point, which is positive, is that um, it has, this building has improved parliamentary work coordination because parliament before the staff was dispersed across Lilongwe in different sorts of offices. And finally, uh, the aspect of reducing costs because parliamentary committees would hire hotels, uh, but now there are five large conference rooms with good amenities at their disposal. So that's the, that's the positive uh, side um, in terms of the functionality of the building. Uh, remember the Vitruvian, uh, you know, the function, you know, stability and aesthetics. Let's go to the, to the, to the next slide. Um, and this is quite important because this actually now speaks to um, the, the, the issues of um, China, Africa or China in Africa and also how African uh, countries engage with foreign actors like China. Um, one of the uh, first things that um, I found out from my, from my informants was that uh, the exclusive manner in which China controlled the design, funding, construction, and subsequently uh, 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 the, the maintenance of the building suggests, suggested the sidelining of Malawian expertise and internal public works processing. So bureaucrats, for example, the public works bureaucrats in the, in the Lilongwe City Council, um, you know, felt, you know, um, um, undermined in a way because they have a set standards of how to do things when there are these big projects, but all these were, sort, were truncated and 
because it was a, a project that had been approved at the very top of the Malawi political establishment. And then the second part is that uh, the final product became um, a Chinese building in a way because of you know, the cut blanche power that uh, the, the Chinese had in terms of um, uh, you find out that uh, the signage of the building uh, is in Mandarin, um, even you know, the exit sign, you, know, you find an, 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 a Mandarin sign and an exit. You, you, and I was talking to the, the technicians there who manage the, the, the electricals. Uh, some of the manuals are in Chinese and even the, the wiring itself um, uh, is in Chinese, where we, you know, in the Western sense, Ways where we think is live is S and and vice versa, and you can see the dramatic, uh, you know, you know, that the drama that can can occur in that in that regard. Then thirdly, um, the the Chinese have continued to stay there. Um, I I I say the building is in three parts, but I don't think that is actually the correct reflection. The building is in four parts because at the back there is a Chinese compound. So the Chinese compound, the, the Chinese still stay there and that has been 10 years. So they, they still stay there and they still, they, they, they maintain the, the building as you saw the, the, in the chamber there. Um, and that in itself, talking to small scale contractors in Malawi, um, uh, they, they are failing to also have a role to play in terms of supplying of, uh, 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 you know, the necessary uh, replacements to some of the things that go there because all of these things are procured from, from China. And, and also the other point is that because this building uh, was uh, constructed by the Chinese and with limited participation of the, EU, of the end user, which is parliament staff, you find out there's, there are a number of omissions. For instance, uh, there's a lack of a screen between the debate chamber and the Vista Scalari, like what, like what I showed you earlier. And uh, um, so one of the uh, informants told me that, uh, I quote, the people who constructed this building never thought about the fact that when you are seated up there, even a small book, which weighs, up, which weighs about 500 grams can be a potential danger to a member of parliament seated down there. But not only that, the library is also poorly designed. I go into detail in the, in the paper. Um, so this is in addition to the limitations I mentioned earlier about the plumbing uh, system. So now to, uh, now to, 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 to conclude um, the presentation, uh, just the final slide, which is just the conclusion. Um, you see there, I just, Pick this picture from the current, it shows um, uh, like, the, you know, the Africa painted red, like uh, in, you, in the same way in which like when I say China was painting, you know, Africa, it's their Chinese aid in the earlier uh, slide. So in this presentation, I leveraged this, this building in Malawi to explore China-Africa relations Chinese foreign aid delivery in Africa, and the extent of African state agency in engagement with the, the big powers. Um, and so in a way I was flagging uh, and showing that the implementation of this project, remember I talked about complete aid project, it highlights this asymmetrical power between the donor and the recipient. And whereas the motivation for the building shows a mutually beneficial arrangement, remember I spoke about the need for a parliament building in Malawi. Um, it is a disproportionate, disproportionate sorry, power that China had in project management through exclusively determining the contractor materials, procurement and labor equipment, which brings to the fore the larger question of the position of African states in determining their cost of their, the cost of their development. So ending with a rejoinder again, uh, I don't know whether the honorable member from Chinji Northeast would be as gushing uh, in, in terms of praise as he was uh, that this uh, building reminds him of uh, the one by King Solomon. Uh, thank you so much.
Thank you, IB. That's great. Okay, so we have now up to an hour for questions. Um, just to remind you that um, you can ask a question by raising your hand if you see um, the raise hand function. And I will scroll up and down and try and find people who, ask, who want to ask a question by raising their hands. Um, or you can ask a question, if you prefer, by typing a message into the chat. Um, and I will then read them out. Um, I see that Dave Harris has got his hand up, and so I'm going to move straight to him. Could the three speakers, um, Joe, uh, Emmanuel and I, be all make sure that your microphones are on so you can leap into action? Um, and Dave, I'm, I'm going to hand over to you to ask your first question. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, David Harris, University of Bradford. Um, so this is a question for Joe and Dawit. Um, so I was quite struck by your comparison between, oh, I'm sorry, I'll also just say thank you very much for those three uh, very, very interesting um, uh, presentations. I was, uh, I was fascinated indeed. But my question is for Joe and Dawit. Um, so I was quite struck by the comparison you made between the national and the regional airports. And I'm wondering if this is a reflection of, or at least partly a reflection of the kind of schizophrenic nature of the Ethiopian government. Uh, because at once, uh, in one part, it is uh, a very nationalist project that's not going. And on the other hand, it is a regional, it, it aims to be, or it pretends to be, or whatever, a regional federation. So is it the fact that then that you've got a the kind of nationalist project, project at the sharp end in the, in, in the international airport, and then uh, you've got a much more regional reflection? Is it a deliberate attempt to kind of, uh, deal with those tensions between those two projects that it's trying to achieve. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Laura and Dowett to address that question, and then we'll move on if there are more questions. I've got some, um, but there certainly will be others with questions. So, Joe and Dowett, do you want to tackle Dave's question? Um, yeah, yeah, happily. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, Dawit, would you like to go first or, or shall I go first and then you can jump in after? Shall I, shall I kick off just in yeah, case yeah, Dawit? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's good, yeah. Go ahead, please. Okay, okay, excellent. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting uh, question, Dave, um, and sort of speaks to the, the current heart of um, a great deal of political drama in Ethiopia. I, th I think there's a few different things there explaining the difference between those airports, and, and some of that is exactly the tension you identify. Some of it is, as people reported to me um, in discussing those different kinds of airports, whilst the international airport and international terminal um, was of a scale that required international financing, so required um, in the case of the initial international terminal, Kuwaiti financing in the 90s and early 2000s, and in the more recent expansion, Chinese financing, um, the Ethiopian state was not able to finance fund either of those projects itself. And because of the reliance on, on both of those construction projects on imported materials, the requirement being the need for a lender who could lend in foreign currency. Um, so some of that is the sort of difference between the, the tensions that come with mega projects of the scale that these two, two buildings are. And I think it's interesting to think perhaps of Wally International is perhaps certainly in that 1990s configuration as, as the first of the mega projects that have characterized the EPRDF as um, developmentalist project uh, in particular. Um, and so with that came a set of requirements that were around um, having uh, international design uh, and international construction. Um, whereas with the regional airports, there was both a strong interest in and freedom to uh, do more regional influence design because the financing did come from the government and it was using local architects, using local construction materials and, and architects that I spoke to that worked on regional airport buildings expressed being given quite, um, quite a degree of freedom by the 
I mean, the various government bodies that have overseen the construction of airports over time, Civil Aviation Authority initially, then the airports company, now the airlines. So being given kind of carte blanche to reflect the, the, uh, the region through the airport building. So I, I think some of it um, is, is a product of that uh, financing difference. But like you say, it reflects very different kinds of political uh, political projects. Is there um, anything you'd like to add on that, Dawit? Trying to see whether Dawit's... Dawit, are you... Um, you are actually muted. If you want to add something you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay, maybe we can come back to Dawit um, later on because there are more questions. Um, I have a question from the, in the chat from Birik Teref. Thank you very much. He says, hi, oh, Dawit says he'll come back. <laughs> Does that, I'm gonna go on to Birik's question um, and then we can come back to um, Dawit. Uh, Birik also has a question for Joe and, um, uh, Dawit, uh, who, and he says, where does the deeply extroverted history of Ethiopian Airlines fit into this paper? Ethiopian Airlines was established in collaboration with two American airlines who were very influential in the initial airport construction. To what extent do different eras and layers of the airline and the airport represent different eras of Ethiopia's international relations, American supported establishment, Chinese funded expansion, etc.? Um, I'm going to, uh, there are no other hands up, but I want to throw in a question because I want to hear the other speakers as well. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just sort of throw in a, a broader question really to all three of you, which I think all three of you can sort of speak to, because I've never heard these papers actually delivered together in this way. And I, I found it very interesting to think about the connections between them and the way in which all three papers deal with tensions between domestic autonomy and dependence on foreign actors um, and the degree to which the local is deemed to be good enough and the need to bring in ideas and techniques from the outside and so it, it did make me wonder and they do it in very different ways and they are obviously very different situations and so I thought it might be quite interesting to hear from each of you about sort of thinking about the idea of hybridity, the, this, this idea about the way in which um, foreign ideas can be absorbed uh, and made into something different, adjusted, um, made fun of, um, appropriated. Um, now that may be something that really you don't find is happening in your three examples, but I'd really quite like to hear perhaps from each of you the extent to which that might be happening. Okay, so perhaps the three of you can have a go at those and then we'll see if there are some more questions uh so um start. emmanuel do you want to start yes thanks so um of course and and this is one area in which perhaps i'll be relying on a lot of cultural theorists who would argue for example that it's um no culture is um insular or you know puritanical in that regard and that um, at, at its very base every culture is an amalgamation of different ideas from different places and I think um, if you think about the world in which we live, that is really um, the situation that nobody can claim, you know, total autonomy or um, a total independence in that regard, that there's a whole lot of interdependency that shapes our cultures and the way we live and think. Um, for me, though, the, the question is that, um, so this is in a sense what is happening with a lot of these projects as I see it. The question is that this, this, whilst, whilst that is happening, there's a sort of um, a reluctance on the part of political elite in particular to admit that this is what they are doing. And so for me, I, I, I see it as a lot of people would probably have no problem with it if, if the elite came out to say that, you know what, um, we want to collaborate with others or we want to um, you know, get help from all of these places. Um, and because we believe that that is the way things have always been and must continue to be for any nation or group of people to, to to continue to exist and to survive. Except that whilst doing that, the rhetoric and the language and you know, the, the way they put it out almost always, um, at least in some of these cases, seems to be that 
we are doing this to show our strength, at least in the case of the cathedral, we are doing this to show our independence. We are doing this to show um, we have also arrived and we can rub shoulders. It is that, you know, in, in a sense, that lack of honesty of saying one thing and then sort of um, behind the scenes doing another that I, I find somewhat troubling. But yes, there's a whole lot of mixing and, you know, um, should I say, um, hybridization that is happening, you know, except that it is not quite um, admitted in a lot of the speeches. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. IB, do you want to have a go at that one? Yes. Um, in, when I was <coughs> talking to my uh, uh, informants, one thing that I noticed was that, um, um, for instance, bureaucrats and people working in parliament, the idea of collaborating with the Chinese on terms of, you know, creating a new parliament for Malawi, uh, you know, it was to them, it's a, it's a good thing, but it is the way in which then this plays out. For instance, um, that which even they call um, our own standards are in a way um, sort of Western standards, because I was talking to architects who had been trained in the UK. And so this appropriation of saying, okay, so what are our standards of, of building? And so, so, so this element of hybridity, you know, is in a way, I think, it's always, um, it's, it's there, but in this case, it is the manner in which the projects then are rolled out. For instance, uh, you find out that the elites at the high, high level would actually allow the Chinese to do things that ordinarily their own institutional framework does not allow. Um, and that will uh, um, sort of like undermine the way in which uh the processes in in the host country are supposed to be done so the the balance is to find uh, the right mix of foreign um ideas and local ownership because without local ownership then the the it it, it remains something that is out there and import uh, which is which is not necessarily rooted within the, 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 the local as it were. Thank you, great. Uh, Joe and Dawit. Let me, um, I'll answer Biruk's question uh, as best I can, and then um, hand over to Dawit. David, um, Dawit's wondering if you could maybe type your question in the chat, because I think he missed it initially. So um, that, that might yeah, be helpful do that. to do while I'm talking, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, great question, Birok. And like you say, the, the history that I'm tracing here involves significant international um, partnership and relations. I'd say, I mean, you're right to point out that there are different eras of that relationship, for sure. And I, and I definitely think that, like you say, there's an American period and there's a sort of Chinese period, if you like, and that tracks massively to shifts in uh, the global economy and particular, in particular to the way that Africa has become a significant uh, element of different kind of geopolitical, geoeconomic, strategic uh, agendas, initially on the part of America, and then much latterly in the part of China. I think I would struggle, though, through my reading of this building, and it'd be great to have a, a conversation with you about this more generally, um, to see that as deeply extroverted, though. Like, if we go back to the, the founding of the, um, the airline itself, yeah, initially the Ethiopian state did actually want the American Airlines to just come in, set up an airline of their own in Ethiopia and to not have any partnership or to not have any, sorry, ownership in that. Um, and that I would have had that come to pass. I think I, you could you could see that as uh, as being or or at least I would be inclined to see that as more of an extrovert history. In fact, that didn't come to pass. And then as as the Ethiopian state kind of wrestled with that American partner to gain more control over the airline, to Ethiopianize it in terms of staff and to push out the kind of American management, you see a kind of struggle going on. It's the kind of struggle that IB and Emmanuel are talking about there, which is um, the kind of power play between different partners and partners of different levels of leverage. But I would 
still say though that despite the Ethiopian state's requirement to have American financing and support management at the beginning and Chinese financing latterly to expand Bole, I would still see though through that through the kind of evolving dynamics and relationships between those two partners um, two sets of partners at two different periods I would still see the kind of if not the full subordination, then a very strong kind of guiding vision that emerges from the Ethiopian state about how it wants exactly those, um, those relationships to unfold. So for me, whilst there is absolutely um, a kind of critical requirement on the part of Ethiopia to have those international relationships, to make those um, to make the airline and the airport project come to pass, I wouldn't, I don't, for me at least, read that as a relationship of dependence on and subordination to those partners. Rather, the story of extroversion is one where the kind of distortion uh, of, of the state is towards the agendas of the outside partner. And I don't see it in the interests, particularly of either America or China, for Ethiopia to have a very strong and vibrant national state-owned airline. Um, they've profited from that at different moments in time, but the kind of guiding vision and ambition behind that, I would say, is, is coming from the Ethiopian side. But I'd be very happy to have a, a conversation with you about that um, offline. Uh, Dawit, are you able to connect and come back on any of those? Oh, that's not a question. Birik says thank you. <laughs> I still can't get uh, Dawit. This is going to be difficult. I'm sorry that your network is unstable. This is, uh, of course, um, was bound to happen and will probably continue to happen throughout the day. If you, if you possibly, if you, if you can, we can try you again in a bit. Uh, if you have um, any thoughts that you want to jot down into the chat, that might be a, a slightly easier way of, of contributing to the discussion. I'm really sorry I, uh, that you are being left out by the technology apologies um i've got two more questions so um let me see if i can find laura's question so laura has a question for emmanuel and she asks how does the sorry laura routley from newcastle um she asks how does the american linkages around the building interact with broader linkages of evangelical pentecostalism in ghana more broadly and she means linkages to the US evangelical organizations. So Emmanuel, in a minute, I'll ask you to answer that question. I have to think about it, but there's another question that's top, popped up from Tony Yeboah. Uh, Tony, um, I'm impressed that you've joined us. Tony joining us from um, far away in America, so I expect it's a horrible time of the night for you. Um, he says, a question for Emmanuel and Joe and Doit. Emmanuel, I'm interested and curious about your missing link concept and how you use the phrase come of age and the term maturity. For many African states, these architectural projects were pursued immediately after independence. The case of Nigeria and Cote d'Ivoire easily come to mind. Ghana under President Nkrumah was a bit different. But more seriously, how are you using these terms? Is it by age or what? Oh, now I've lost it. Hang on. Contextualizing them might be helpful. Joe and Dawit. You talk about the bottom-up approach, but your method includes elite interviews. I'm not sure what you mean by elite interviews, but I'm wondering why you didn't limit your interviews to everyday people in Ethiopia because of your bottom-up approach. Okay, thank you very much for those questions. Uh, they're great. Uh, let's take those. I've got another one coming up, um, but I'm gonna leave that for now. So, Emmanuel, do you want to tackle yours first? <clears throat> okay, um, thank you, Laura. Um, so, as far as the um, American linkage, linkages is concerned, um, so the, a lot of the evangelical ideas in themselves, um, I think this is, um, I don't remember the author now, but there's a lot of um, interconnection between what happens locally as far as evangelical theology is concerned and what happens in America. And um, for example, if, if we take a look at um, Bishop um, Nicholas Duncan Williams, who is the the um, the head of fundraising for the for the board of trustees that the president put together, he was at Donald Trump's um, inauguration in, in America, where he preached a sermon and prayed. 
Um, and so even though this is happening in Ghana and locally, there's a lot of um, connections from Ghana to the United States and then back. Um, so there are all of these um, relationships that I, I should say they were happening before. The cathedral only, I think, served to provide a very useful platform for them to become more visible. Um, I don't know if that, that answers, answers the question. Um, as far as Tony's question is concerned, so the come of age and the maturity question, these are not necessarily, so fine, these are, these are my, my, my words, but these are words that are based on the, the way in which I read the language of the president and the others. And um, for example, um, when the architect, for example, says that we have, we, are, we have created a modern nation, and I'm sort of paraphrasing here, we have created a modern nation, and yet we have no 21st century pieces of architecture to show our modernity and our independence. And so these are the sorts of ideas embedded within these forms of rhetoric that I draw on to say that um, they want to show that you know what it's been a while. So yes, there was the Nkrumah phase where he sought to use architecture to show the nation's independence. So there was that. But a lot of these people feel as if um, we have moved beyond that. We have made some progress. We have had relative peace and stability and democracy. And so we need another, should I call them, generation of um, generation of pieces of architecture to represent where we are now, which is um, far ahead of where we were maybe 60 years ago, which is why it's sort of tied to independence celebrations and all of that. Maybe I should chip in that David Ajayi, who is the architect for this project, and um, British Ghanaian, um, was actually, as part of this, was handed a whole lot of other projects to undertake, some of which were urban scale, and he was actually commissioned to design a new parliament building, which um, various protests, you know, managed to get the po political elite to put on hold. But yes, these are ideas that I get from, from the rhetoric that they themselves put out. Yeah. Thanks. Do you want to have a go at, um, uh, also at Tony's question about the missing link? The, the missing link is what I just, what I just addressed. It says Sorry, that, uh, I'm not listening, am I? <laughs> I think oh, shall, I, to... shall I answer Tony's no, question? No, you can I'm trying to do too many things at once. Yeah, um, yeah it's, a good, it's a good question, Tony. And um, I mean, I think partly it came through, the decision of which sources to use came through what exactly we were seeking to understand about this very modern airport building. And on the one hand, we did... Um, want to understand how has it come to look the way it has and to understand pre precisely the dynamics um, that Birok's question is pointing to. So to what extent is, has, has the airport, its location, its site, its function within the Ethiopian kind of national development project, to what extent has that been uh, driven by outside forces? And that's why we um, did in part still do elite interviews. And yeah, I didn't specify um, exactly what kinds of interviews there were, but there were um, 20 or so of those interviews and they included people who worked in key uh, institutions within the Ethiopian state. So Ethiopian airports enterprise, Ethiopian airlines, um, the various ministries of um, um, finance, as they've been called over the years and engineers and architects that have been contracted to work on the expansion of Bole. Um, and so that was important to us because we did want to understand precisely how in practice those dynamics, those international relationships had unfolded. But we wanted to round that out and ground it also at the same time in, in how that airport as a modern building is seen by citizens. Uh, of Addis. So we could have exclusively done just the second and not the first. Um, however, um, this is part of a bigger project. I'm also looking at Katoka International Airport in Ghana, in Accra, and there for the comparative work that I've been doing, um, that sort of uh, elite aspiration agenda and its international partnerships and trade-offs is, is a part of that. So it's part of a bigger project where where understanding how these modern buildings get built is kind of a key component. Okay, thank you. 
Right, we've got two more questions. Um, I've got one for Joe and Dawit um, from Naum Teklu. Uh, speaking on Ethiopia's Bole Airport, it is said that, this is a rather nice quote, underneath this gleaming modern facade, we find a situation where imperialism meets ultra-modernism, end quote. Can you shed some light on how such isms interwove in the above context? So that's for you. Uh, a question for Emmanuel from Laura Routley. I wanted to ask, she's pursuing this Pentecostalism. Uh, I wanted to ask about what, uh, whether what is happening around the cathedral is a shift or a continuation of a trend in influence of US evangelical actors, or maybe something slightly different about a continuation of a different level because of the way in which they engage more directly with the state. She says, you don't have to answer this, but I think you do. Um, I've got another, I'm going to collect a few questions. Um, a question from Irene Addo from Ghana um, to Emmanuel, the cathedral project seems to be on hold. Can you offer an explanation for the silence? She's holding you accountable. Uh, and that is, I've had some thanks from Dawit and Tony, but I think I might, sorry, Dawit's actually replying to Tony uh, for his question. I don't know if you can all read this. I expect you all can, but let me just outline what that what he says. He says, thank you, Tony, for your very good question. Bottom up approach is not exclusive, uh, meaning that it is possible to include the views of elites who are engaged in the airline and airport mega projects, triangulating data obtained from officials and those who are working in the airport does not uh, doesn't have any negative implications on the approach we um, um, employed. So I've got a question for Emmanuel and I've got a question for Joe and Dawit and I've now got a question for IB. So I'm gonna take that one before I hand over to the speakers. A uh, question from Daniel Mulligeta to IB. How do you think the Chinese presence building affects parliamentary processes for democracy in Africa? So a nice simple question for IB. Uh, and I'm gonna hold it there. We'll come back to more questions if we have more time. Um, so I'm gonna start with, um, I think I might start with Emmanuel, is that okay? Yeah. Yes, so Laura's question, I think I sort of, I partially answered it. I think it's an interesting question. Thank you for it. Um, so as I, I, I indicated earlier, there, there, there has always been a relationship between evangelicalism and Pentecostalism in Ghana and America. And I pointed out, for example, that the, the chairperson of the fundraising committee was at Donald Trump's um, inauguration, of course, invited by people of like mind. Um, and I think in, in, in working on this chat, I came across the work of um, Paul Gifford, who studied, you know, a lot of these um, Christian groups in their early days, I think in 92, 93, thereabouts. And I think he speaks of um, a lot of them making a lot of reference to books that they were reading from um, American pastors at the time. Um, and even in some cases, there were some linkages between what was happening in Ghana and what was happening in Nigeria. And people like Idahosa were very crucial for the beginning of charismatic, the charismatic movement in Ghana. So yes, there were some pre-existing linkages. In, in a more recent book, I think he titled it Exporting the American Gospel. It's by Paul Gifford and a series of other, I think Steve Brewer and I think two others. Um, the point of the book, again, is to show that for a very long time, um, American evangelical ideas have gone out beyond the borders of the United States to places, especially in Africa, where these ideas have become useful. And a lot of these have been through um, linkages. For example, it is the case that if they were hosting a particular event in Ghana, they would invite some of the more prominent you know, American pastors and preachers to come and then be at those events. So yes, there were all of these linkages before. The cathedral has just um, you know, made it more, more clear and more evident, and especially how these linkages connect to a certain pro-Israel you know, ideology. That in particular, I think, is what has become even more prominent to the building of this cathedral, even though, again, it's existed in some, you know, um, in some, in some form prior to, to the making of this project. Um, now, to the question of the cathedral being on hold, it's interesting. I think it probably has something to do with COVID, um, because when they did the sword cutting, you know, when they did the ceremony to do the Israeli foundation stone somewhere on the 5th of March, I mean, this was a time where COVID had just started to strike and everybody was starting to shut down. I, I think it's probably two things. One, which is that a lot of the funds which might have come this way in, you know, from America may have 
um, been channeled elsewhere, or perhaps the optics of it won't look too good when in the midst of a pandemic, you proceed to try and build a cathedral. So I suspect that it's, it's probably a question of the optics of it and how um, it will look if they just proceeded, but also perhaps the funding may not be as easily available, obviously because of the economic situation of the world due to COVID. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Manuel. IB. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for that uh, question. Um, this is quite interesting because uh, China seems to be targeting countries that need uh, parliament buildings. Uh, so, so the need here, um, I want to qualify it by saying, so these countries usually don't have proper parliament buildings. So in terms of uh, the functionality of space, uh, you find out that uh, this actually, you know, affects it positively. But however, you know, such kind of state buildings um, are not only read in terms of just functions, there's a symbolic element to it. And, and what do we read into uh, China's um, uh, presence in this uh, type of buildings? So one of the things that I've sort of like seen in my studies is that uh, the, it is the influence that the Chinese project and the kind of hold that they have on the political elite. And when I say political elite, I mean even across the, across the political parties. Um, so in a way, um, whether it's party A that is, in, that, is a, uh, that is a parliamentary majority or that is in power or party B, so the Chinese seem to have found a method of um, creating this, uh, of projecting their influence. And this uh, brings us to the um, larger debate in, Ch in China in Africa or China Africa studies, where people are asking whether China is a, is a new colonial power or a, ne or a neo colonial power. Um, a close reading of this, it, from my own perspective, I reject this kind of uh, approach because um, China's approach is different from um, the Western colonial, you know, uh, matrix that, that we know. But it is close to uh, something of uh, developing these uh, spheres of, of influence. And uh, um, so th this idea of mixing the domestic and the international, to best read this is also to juxtapose what China is doing in these parliament buildings and their larger you know, engagement in Africa through FOCAC. So you will find out that uh, the FOCAC um, is this instrument that works at bilateral level um, with each state and with the AU, and there is this diplomatic element to it. And at, uh, on, on a domestic level, so if the Chinese hover around the parliament buildings, they always sort of project their influence within the domestic space through, through the parliament buildings, both in terms of functionality and also in terms of the, the symbolic element that it is China who built us this structure. And then they connect it with what they do um, at FOCA. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, when I was reading, I found out that at every um, General Assembly meeting at the UN, there is a sideline meeting of FOCA. So in a way, so China is, you know, projecting this kind of sphere of influence in Africa that can best be understood by looking at both the domestic and the, what they do again at, at the international level. Great, thanks. Um, Joe and Dawit, question from Nahum. Uh, yeah, thanks Nahum. Um, so, Good question in terms of, yeah, pushing me to explain that a bit more, which I, I suspect I didn't do very well in the presentation. Um, I think here in, in the sense in which I'm using the word imperialism is um, reflective of Ethiopian imperialism specifically, and a kind of nod to the fact that there are significant inheritances in this very modern building that have come through from the imperial period and Haile Selassie's particular ambitions around this airport and the airline. So um, in tracing those continuities, you know, the site at Bole was chosen to allow the airline to become a jet, the first jet 
airline on the continent so it was put in that particular position with a particular kind of logic and since that point in time there have been certain continuities um, so for instance the EPRDF on thinking in the 1990s about the need to expand Bolle airport um, picked up plans that were um, drawn up in the Derg period so rather than kind of scrapping what had come before which we see, we, we see in a lot of um, contexts where a new regime comes in and they seek to kind of completely rewrite the slate and drop any plans kind of um, drawn up by a previous government or regime. Certainly in Ghana, the other country that I'm studying in the context of this project, there is a real tendency when there's a switch between uh, the two dominant parties in Ghana for, for the new party that's just taken over to kind of abandon projects that have been started under the last um, government and, and to kind of start with a clean slate. And in Ethiopia, you don't see that uh, at all in the same way, certainly not in the context of the airport, at least. Um, and so not only were plans kind of drawn up in the 80s and the military regime used to expand that airport at Bole, but personnel that were kind of trained under Haile Selassie's imperial government and then continued uh, through during the Derg period were brought back from retirement to oversee the project. So there's a real kind of a, um, uh, sense of continuity, I think, underneath that, that really modern airport building, which you might be inclined to see as a bit of a rupture, a kind of EPRDF, kind of carte blanche, kind of new period, new government, Kuwaiti financing, it all kind of looks um, kind of perhaps like a break with the past. And, and, and with that sort of imperialism meets ultra modernity, I was just trying to point to underneath that, that shiny new modern structure, there's quite a lot of continuity. Great, thanks. Um, Dawit, I hope that if you've got more to add that you'll um, contribute more to the chat. Um, so we now have two more questions for IB. Um, from Irene Addo, uh, China seems to be involved in many projects in Africa. Is there an agenda and how are the people responding to that strategy? And from Laura, um, says she was fascinated by the vignette of the electrics being wired differently. I wonder how important this is to a sense of true ownership over the building. If you struggle to maintain it, I'm becoming more and more interested in the idea and importance of maintenance and the material politics of it. Okay, so IB, do you want to have a go at those two? Um, thank you. Um, so the, thank you, Irene, for that question. Uh, so the, you're asking whether um, there's, you know, is there an agenda? Uh, that's the first part. Of it. And, in a way, um, I'll best answer this by saying uh, there seems to be a formula to what the Chinese are doing. Um, but inversely, I have not really found that uh, uh, the African elites or you know, themselves, particularly the ruling elites, are aware of what is happening. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this by way of example. So when I went to Zimbabwe, uh, the Zimbabwean government was talking about, government officials was talking about this new Chinese parliament building. And then I showed them the, the Malawi parliament building. And then they said, yeah, it looks like ours. I said, yes, because it's, it's you know, so they, they, so they thought it was their own design, but it seems, so the Chinese have a formula and, and they are very good at, um, at, uh, at doing what they, 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 they do. And then the second part of uh, the second part of your question um, about what are people saying, and because I, I also I didn't talk to Elise alone, I spoke to um, focus group. Um, uh, I did focus groups with the ordinary citizens. There is I can say some of the patterns that I saw was that you know the suspicion um, in terms of ordinary citizens thinking what is China up to? But part of this suspicion is mediated by the lack of trust that they have in the political elites because they, they believe that the, these elites can actually, you know, uh, you know, and sell us for a song in a way, for the political panada, you know, expression. So it's not only what China is doing, but the, the trust issues between you know, ordinary citizens and, 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 and the elites. And you pose, you find out that they have a different way of approaching this. They would want China to be involved, but they would want China to be involved in their own terms. They would want more participation, more involvement, which is not necessarily 
uh, the Chinese approach. It's not a democratic, you know, approach like what people would, uh, would want. So having said that, the elites here in Africa may not have the strategy uh, as China has. So I'm not sure about the agenda, but I know that there's a formula. And then um, to Laura's question, um, thank you so much, Laura. And actually, this is the, this is the main point. Um, because these buildings, in a way, from my understanding of, or from my analysis, they are not built to uh, last without the Chinese. Like I said when I was, when I was uh, responding to Irene, they have a formula. So the buildings are structured in such a way that China has to be involved in them one way or the other. So you find out that um, um, the, <clears throat> the materials, it's just the, the, the east part, the materials um, are Chinese. And then, so you, you may think that when you want to make some replacements, you have to go um, to China and even, even, um, um, even get a loan. I, I'll just finish off with, an, with a, 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 an anecdote of what I saw in Lesotho. So China donated this building uh, it's, a, it's a national convention center. Then it uh, fell apart. After it fell apart, uh, so, so after it fell apart, Lesotho went to China because China offered a 10 million yuan loan for them to refurbish the building and contract another Chinese companies to come and construct it. So you can see that uh, the maintenance is actually part of the story. And you are right. You are right on the money that the maintenance is as important as the process of constructing the building. Thank you, that's great. Uh, I've got a response from Dawit to, to Dave's question. Uh, he says, of course, the political dynamics in Ethiopia have had implications on the airport projects uh, in the country. Ethnic politics has created tensions across the nation that might heighten regional tension uh, on the airport projects. However, the airports are state owned um, that is controlled by the government which administers the finance and their functions. It is the federal, federal government responsible for the airports. So it is not as uh, such a point of debate in the political arena of the country today. Great. Um, do we have any final questions? I think we've got time for a final round if anybody's got anything else they'd like to raise. I'm not seeing any hands. I've got a kind of horrible final question to everybody. Uh, which is ridiculously broad. Anyway, I'm going to do it since nobody else is popping into. Oh, excuse me, I have a question. Uh, we have. I'll raise my hand. Oh, Philip, great. Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I think this relates to the Ethiopia uh, paper as well as to the parliament building paper. Um, so, on one hand, I mean, the, the Chinese have also built and funded the. Um, African Union building in Addis Ababa, which cost around $200 million. Um, so they've completely paid for that and built, built that, like, I guess, the parliament buildings in other countries. Um, so that cost $200 million. Um, you know, if each African country would have pledged an average of $4 million, they could have completely funded that themselves and take ownership of it. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, on the other hand, costs almost $5 billion. Uh, which and it was pretty much I mean it's a way to simplify but pretty much crowdfunded by the Ethiopian public yeah through donations and donations and private bonds so I somehow there seems to be disconnect between yeah like the Ethiopian government manages to rally the public around a, a dam which obviously has great political significance um, and get five billions on the other hand the AU um, and, and, and in, in the case of Malawi or other, other governments are not even able to fund or unwilling to fund parliament buildings themselves, um, whether that's through the public, through you know, fundraising and bonds, or through just paying for it themselves. I was wondering if anyone you know, knows, I just find an interesting disconnect, yeah. Thanks, Philip. Can you just tell us where you're from? Um, I'm from Switzerland, but I've lived in Ethiopia for the last eight years and about to start uh, my master's at SOAS, yeah. Oh, welcome. <laughs> Great, thank you. Does, so I didn't see Philip's hand up, so it may be that I'm not seeing hands. Has anybody yeah, else? I didn't see the function, I just didn't notice. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, you need to have the participants 
you need to click on participants and then you should see everybody and then it has this raise hand icon that you can click I on. just posted my question as a text as well if you just in case you want to read it or yeah repeat. yeah I see it thank you that's great any other final questions that's that's a, a a good one for everybody to have a go at I'm going to add my one to it so that the uh, the uh, panel um, members can all have a have a sort of final say um, I wanted to ask about so i think the papers are all very strong on the discussions about how the buildings can be used as sites for political discussion and debate and lot a lot of the detail about resources and design and function of these important iconic national organizations but i wanted it if you could say a little bit more uh, some of you have done this a bit but a little bit more about buildings as a metaphor for the state itself um, all three of them are in different ways have the potential to do this um, and so I'd like to ask um, you to step back a little bit from the actual debates around the buildings um, and speak to the idea of the state that each of your buildings might convey. So what do the airport, the cathedral and the parliament tell us about the modern day state in Ethiopia, Ghana and Malawi? So I'm going to ask, um, I've got another question here, hang on a sec. Uh, Caleb has a question in the chat. Uh, I'll read that. Most projects financed through donations and loans from foreign countries are subjected to the exclusion of local professionals such as architects. Uh, probably one for Emmanuel particularly. This phenomenon is visible in most Ethiopian projects like the train stations built along the Addis Ababa Djibouti uh, railway line by the Chinese. Hence, Dawit and Joanne, have you tried to look into the profiles of design professionals involved in the airport expansion project? Uh, I have, I think, another couple of questions. Uh, Marie says, uh, uh, wants to come in on a discussion which I've lost the train of in my mind, but I'm going to read it out and others will perhaps be better. That was, sorry, Marie, it, uh, it, it's just to address Philip's um, comparison between the GERD and, and, you know, something like the African Union building. Could you, could you elaborate? Funding. So Philip was saying, you know, how come the African Union building was um, financed fr uh, from the outside uh, by China, whereas the GERD was, has been crowdfunded? And I, I just wonder if it's not because of the ultimate use of these two buildings. I mean, the GERD, I imagine, is going to make money um, and so is likely to attract, you know, popular interest. It's, it's probably an investment by people who hope that they will have a return on it. Uh, whereas I imagine the African Union building is much less likely to make money <laughs> for the people, uh, or at least not directly. Um, and I, I just wonder if that's that's the explanation. Okay, that's something else to throw into the mix. I have another point from uh, Emmanuel Teshome Kebede. Uh, China A just inaugurated a public park near the Prime Minister's office here in Addis last week. The Chinese ambassador made an interesting remark during the inauguration, quote, Chinese aid comes without strings attached. Um, the design and construction was made by a Chinese company, however there are clear narratives of the design that have originated from local influence or the project patron, the Prime Minister himself. Question to Joanne and IB, uh, even if the Chinese come with the project budget, can it be that the influence of local parties shy away from actually influencing what is made with the aid money? Okay, I think that's given you plenty to address for your final round of comments. So I'm going to start with um, Joe and uh, um, and Dawit, um, and could you take on as much of that as you are able? Okay, great. Yeah, I've got four questions down that I've got to answer, and I know that Dawit, because uh, of his connection, is going to type his responses into the chat, I think. So look out for those. Um, so in terms of... Uh, Mine, I might deal with those in reverse order, I think. So yeah, Emmanuel, that's a really great question about China and the strings and attached. And yeah, certainly in the interviews that I've done uh, with Ethiopian state officials, there is a disconnect, like you say, between what they say publicly, China has no strings attached versus what's said privately, where they admit absolutely that Chinese aid comes with strings attached and those strings attached are to do exactly with who constructs the building. And so quite often China is lending money to Ethiopia and it, that money is then going to a Chinese construction company. And quite often it's the case that the construction company is the one that comes to the government and then secures financing to allow it to construct that building. And there are 
exactly as you say, kind of really important questions to ask and the same questions that Cavelli is asking in the, um, in the chat about, um, sorry, Caleb is asking in the chat about um, who gets excluded from projects as a result of that um, financing. And uh, the case in Ethiopia is certainly that in the international airport, it has been international architects that have been involved in those projects. Um, in the case of the recent expansion, the um, Ethiopian airport company um, project managers that I spoke to of the, the expansion said that initially China had wanted to have a Chinese architect to construct the the recent expansion and the, the government had pushed back on that and said no we want an international um, architecture firm to do the design because we don't want in their words sort of informally we don't want some cheap airport we want to know it's a proper international standard airport and so in pushing back on the Chinese side they got a Singaporean um, design firm that had designed um, airports globally to to do the design now there were quite a lot of constraints in terms of um, the um, them wanting to fit that design into what was already there and not have um, some some completely separate extensions so it was already decided that the design wouldn't deviate much from what was already constructed there in the in the early 2000s whereas on the domestic and regional airports what was much more interesting was that 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 was seen as reserved for the domain of Ethiopian architects and that as a result of the airport company being able to finance those projects itself, it was seen that they very much wanted to use those projects to nurture domestic architects. So there are absolutely, and as IB's papers really beautifully pointed out, um, really big exclusions that, that do come with that, that's really important to pay more attention to. Um, the question about financing, global versus domestic financing. Um, I think Marie's right, yeah, there are different kinds of projects. I think the Ethiopian government, I mean, um, perhaps realized with GERD that it was gonna be really almost impossible for a project with such geopolitical um, tension surrounding it coming from Egypt to secure international financing. So I think it was seen as perhaps, if we don't raise the money ourselves, we're not gonna get it from any other source. But it's characteristic of being a developing country that you have a foreign exchange shortage. That's the kind of structural nature of what it is to be a developing country. And so all developing countries at all points in their development, including Korea, Taiwan, China, have, done, have undertaken international borrowing of various kinds to fund projects. So it's not that you might, the very fact of having to borrow internationally stops you from ever being able to own any project or have any control of your domestic agenda. It's characteristic that you will have to at that point. So it's much more nuanced, I think, a question of what do you do and how does that international borrowing fit in with your wider kind of state building agenda and what kind of ownership do you have over it? Which then brings me to Julia's question about what does the airport tell us about the Ethiopian state? I think there's quite a few different things um, there that the airport tells us. There's certainly a, a story of continuity um, across these major ruptures that have occurred um, with the, within the Ethiopian state since the 1970s. There's a story of ambition, I think, that can be read through the airport building. Um, Ethiopia now has um, this uh, hub at Addis Ababa, which simply didn't exist 10 years ago. And that's entirely through the kind of ambition of its state-owned airline. And that is um, functionally separate from the Ethiopian state. Um, however, it is state-owned and extremely well supported by uh, successive governments within Ethiopia. Uh, and so there's a story of, of grand ambition. There's a story of continuity. There's a story of, yes, being constrained, but finding opportunities within, the, within those constraints to kind of leverage international support to support a domestic agenda, um, I'd say. Thank you, Joe. Um, I just want to read out Dawit's response to Caleb. He says, interesting question. One of the findings in our research was that the buildings do not reflect the Ethiopian culture. I think this is according to your respondents. The buildings, uh, the projects reflect the interests of the donors. 
there were Ethiopian architects who uh, had, were involved in the design, but they didn't try to make the design of the building and the buildings Ethiop have an Ethiopian touch. It's the failure of those Ethiopian architects to reflect the nation's history and cultural values onto the building. Um, uh, they want to uh, work following um, training on uh, abroad, he suggests. Thank you very much, Dawit. Now I'm going to move to Emmanuel to answer his final questions, please. Okay, so um, quite interested because um, in terms of who gets to do these buildings, just shortly before I go to that, um, in the case of the cathedral, it was interesting because um, for the politicians, they said they were going to select a Ghanaian. But to be fair, this is um, Vivdaje is British Ghanaian and had all of his training in the UK. And none of it in Ghana was never, you know, trained in any architecture school in Ghana, which I, 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 I think was a very um, ingenious way of going around that. So they can always say he's Ghanaian. But really, the question is does it in any way validate Ghanaian expertise? I would say no. Um, in that regard. Now, in terms of what this tells us, I, I think um, maybe similarly to what Joanne just shared, I would say a certain you know, desire for ambition. But beyond that, I would say, like I, I, I indicated earlier, there's this ambivalence of you know, a state trying to assert itself, and yet underneath all of that rhetoric of you know, asserting itself, there's all of these um, sort of dependencies that did they put out, but not as much as you know is happening. For example, the museum, which is supposed to be inside the cathedral, which is one of the aspects of the cathedral that is put out a lot as to show that um, it's not just another church building, there are other functions. Um, if you read between the lines and even within some of the publications, it is quite clear that it is going to be operated and run by the Americans and not by the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board. I suspect that a lot of the artifacts that are going to be there are probably going to be brought from the American Museum of the Bible. And so there's this ambivalence of a state that is trying to say that, you know what, um, we are independent, we are assertive, we have our own ambition, we have our own ideas, we can create a Ghanaian cathedral that is different from anything that, you know, the West has created in their Gothic cathedrals. And yet, like I, I, I indicate, there's all of these, okay, but it's, it looks, we, we are taking inspiration from Washington, but St. Paul's, you know, but we need the American Museum of the Bible. So there's that ambivalence. And I think it's, it's clear in other areas of, of the states, this kind of struggle to assert ourselves as a country whilst at the same time and um, being able to own and, and, and determine our own uh, uh, sort of path to that, to that difficult terrain, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Finally, to IB. IB, you've had a last minute question, which is quite, in uh, I want to sort of put to you just if you want to find an answer for it quickly. Ben from Benjamin Hernsdorf, who asks you, I think he's referring to the sort of rumours about um, some Chinese surveillance in some of these big buildings that they're erecting. This might be also a question for Daniel later in the day. Um, and he's asking about, you know, um, what you think the rumours about um, the idea that the Chinese are listening into private and confidential sessions in the parliaments, um, do you think that they could be true and how would this Trojan horse strategy affect future realisations of Chinese contracts in the African continent? But um, your other questions as well, please. Hi, B. Uh, okay. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, maybe let me also start by this, the last one and going back. Um, in terms of the surveillance um, uh, technology, technology in these buildings, um, I'm gonna be sure I know that uh, there was like also another related story on um, the AU uh, building, uh, something that was discovered by Algerian um, um, technocrats. I think it came out in 2017. But um, what, I, uh, what, what I noticed was that in the Malay Parliament building, the, the wiring, the, the local area network was also laid out by, by the Chinese uh, when, uh, when they were now you know, doing the finishings of the building. So the, but now uh, when I was talking to the ICT uh, people in there, they were telling me that um, the the they want to change it but it's difficult to change it the 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 server you know the, there's a server and this server is, uh, is 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 in one room so it splits um the server for the like the mics and all, all those things and then the security server 
So the Chinese um, control the, the servers there, uh, the, the, the other side, the security servers, because they, they know, like I told, I, to, I, I spoke about that most of these things are, are in Chinese. So the extent to which they can use that information, um, uh, it's, I think it's moot, but what is uh, a fact is that the, the system that currently works in that building uh, was laid out by the Chinese, but there's also this desire by people in parliament now to, to actually to uh, do away with that. But they have a problem because the building has not yet been fully uh, handed over. That's always like, so the building looks like it has been handed over, but it is still, you know, part of, you know, the, the, Ch the Chinese maintenance, as I say. Um, so uh, then the question on uh, uh, the China no strings attached. There's a very interesting anecdote when I was talking to one of the um, former minister, cabinet ministers who served for about 25 years in Zimbabwe, who was close to the, to the parliament building project. He said, actually China, yes, it's correct that China, there are no strings attached that you see, but actually the Chinese they have more strings, the difference is that they are hidden. Um, so, and, 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 and why uh, that makes sense is that um, the idea of uh, the financing model that, the, that they use, uh, when I was talking to people in the Ministry of Finance in, in, uh, in aid coordination in Malawi and also in the, in the Soto, I found out that the model that they are using, it is difficult to for the local actors to actually to have a say because they cry that unlike other financiers like the African Development Bank um, or, or the Japanese, uh, you, you cannot see uh, uh, the Chinese sent with your naked eye you know, in a dramatic way. So the, you can't see the money. Uh, all that you see, you see the product. And as I said about the complete aid uh, system that they use. So in a way, they, they can say that they, are, they do that. And finally, on that point, this idea of appropriating uh, local components, as you mentioned, that this pack is you know, well done by the Chinese, but then they, it looks maybe Ethiopian. They are, they are very good at it, actually, because they, they use design teams that would come into the country and actually look at um, what may look uh, what well, may look and feel as as local so that's part of their toolkit and then the final question on um, uh, what julia asked about uh, maybe the building as a metaphor i know my colleagues have already touched on that but i'll just speak about one that you know it it um, sort of when you look at that building in a way you can also look at how the element of uh, state consolidation but it it can be in various ways but I'm saying state consolidation in this way, that here is a state that is actually a post-colonial state that is actually creating its own technology of governance, creating its own capital city. Before they had the, the, the executive, uh, as in the, 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 the government offices, they didn't have a parliament, they don't have a Supreme Court. So they're actually like a, saying a modern contemporary state should have this aspect. So in a way, the building is part of uh, the, the missing points in the chessboard, as it were. So red, uh, in that particular perspective, you can say that uh, it is part of the idea of consolidating a, um, um, a contemporary um, Malawi state, as it were. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you uh, very, very much. Um, thank you to everybody who's asked brilliant questions. Um, and thank you very much to our three speakers and our four paper givers. Thank you to Dawit for persisting with the technology uh, struggles. Um, we're going to stop now for a break. We reconvene at one o'clock for the second panel, um, which is going to be chaired by my colleague Daniel Mulligata. Um, so have a nice break. Um, I think you can leave the connection open. It will remain open throughout the break. Um, there'll be obviously nothing happening on your screen. Um, or you can come back to it at one o'clock 
uh, or indeed if you want to, to uh, skip the next panel and come back at 3.30 using the same link that you used before. Um, hope everybody's happy with that. If you're not, um, do send us a, a, a message.